Welcome to the Courage Barbell Unlimited Podcast with your host, legendary powerlifter and strength athlete, Chad Ikes. For most, the journey of strength starts in the gym, but should inevitably expand through all aspects of life. Join us as we discuss all things strength. Now, here's your host, Chad Ikes. On today's episode, we have another special guest that I think is going to be kind of interesting, entertaining, and fun all at the same time. We have Allie Gilbert, and who has taken off pretty good recently. It seems like things have taken off well for you. And you're, I mean, you've been training people for a long time, but you've kind of taken it under your wing to focus on men's health. I have. And and telling telling the audience that I'm going to be entertaining and interesting is a lot of pressure, Chad. <laughs> <laughs> I trust me. I think you're going to live up to it. So on my walk this morning, I was, I was thinking about this podcast and I try to walk every morning, at least in the morning, at least once. And I was, I was thinking about <clears throat> the concept that you're a female, but you've taken on men's health. And I was curious why you did that. And I, I, my main thought came into, came into, with with my suicide and depression, I've seen a lot of psychologists. And I, I don't think that psychologists are really like this high level of intelligence. I think they've learned and now they're looking from the outside in. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, do you feel like like taking on men's health? Do you feel like you kind of had a, a better perspective because you're looking at men as a woman, like from the outside? Uh I, I think it just, it, it was something that naturally came to me uh, growing up, playing a lot of sports and just being like a tomboy. Um, when I graduated with an exercise science degree, I was like, oh, I want to do strength and conditioning because that's kind of what everybody who graduates with that wants to do. And you realize how saturated or weird that market is. And then you make like zero money unless you're at like the super elite level. Um so I was like, cool, maybe we don't go this route, but I still wanted to work with athletes. And I'd worked at a commercial gym in my hometown of Greenwich, Connecticut, which is very wealthy, had a lot of the Wall Street guys because we're the first town out of New York. So a lot of those guys were very type A personality, um, you know, coming in the gym for a 5 a.m. workout, need to go catch the train. And a lot of their wives would train at the gym later in the day. And I realized I didn't relate to the women as well as I did with the guys. Cause I don't, I'm not like a designer person, like with uh, handbags and, and uh, clothes and stuff. I'm like more talking about cars and sports and stuff like that. So I liked the fact that these guys were super competitive and they're willing to do the work. And a lot of them happen to play golf. And I didn't know anything really about golf because I played soccer in college. And I was like, well, golf's a sport and these guys take it really seriously. Let me look up golf fitness and there's a certification for golf fitness. So I went all in on that. And I was like the go to golf fitness person in Greenwich for years. And it brought me a predominantly male clientele. And a lot of the discussion with training and this is in person at the time goes over to nutrition and then goes over to well-being and performance and hormones and stuff like that. And I was like, wow, guys are really kind of clueless as to hormone optimization. A lot of them are afraid of TRT. They don't really understand that world. And so that brought me into studying men's health and hormones. And I just went and studied as much as I could, learned everything I could about that, partnered with doctors, shadow doctors, went to medical conferences, like everything. And fast forward to present day, now I have a network of physicians that I align with and other practitioners who handle that men's health space because obviously I can't prescribe anything. I'm not a medical practitioner. Um, but we focus our coaching on guys because a lot of guys suffer from a lot of the same things women do, which is overtraining, under eating, body dysmorphia, a lot of those issues, in addition to the sexual performance issues that they don't really equate to being related to things outside of directly testosterone. So that's kind of like how we landed here. Um, mm -hmm. But I also say like daddy issues kind of helped uh, 
facilitate that <laughs> as a joke. <laughs> that, it's interesting, though, what you just said about men and women suffering a lot of the same issues. Yeah. Like I've and noticed it, I've noticed with a lot of guys there's yeah, like I can see that they have self-esteem issues. I can see that they have body dysmorphia issues. But they won't a man won't recognize it. A woman generally speaking everyone's an individual generally speaking i've noticed women are more accepting of those things and i actually kind of prefer training women because mm -hmm. i don't think they're as hard-headed as guys in they're the not. big picture yeah yeah it, it's funny because like i do have a lot of male colleagues who prefer working with women um same reasons that I like to work with guys, I think. And women are much more social about these things because we've been conditioned to always worry about our physique and our appearance and all of that. It's not so prominent in powerlifters because um, they are not so concerned. They're more concerned with the scale going up usually yeah. unless they have to make weight. But uh, in guys who are going for aesthetics or who maybe never have seen their abs or have abs and want more abs, there's a lot of unhealthy relationships with the body dysmorphia and they will admit it to me. Cause I think being a female, I help provide that empathetic side. Cause I've also been there. Like I think anyone in the fitness industry who's dieted has experienced some level of body dysmorphia. Cause the leanest that you get anything above that is obesity to us. Mm -hmm. Like we just don't do well with that. So I can talk with them openly about it and let them know like, yeah, you're not alone because there's a lot of guys that deal with this. They just don't necessarily talk about it, but they're worried about how they look with their shirt off. They're worried about the lower back fat, the love handles, the belly fat that a lot of guys experience. So those are no different than women just outwardly talking about anything that bothers them. So you always see like, you know, ads for like cellulite in women and you know, fat loss here and there, but you don't see like, hey, this will get rid of your lower back back fat in guys as often, at least. So you're giving me some marketing ideas. <laughs> That's if it's it interesting. Work, I'm not I'm not responsible if it doesn't. Like work. I have I have some young teens that I work with, and a couple of them are a little on the heavy side. And yeah. I'm like, it's 75 degrees. Take your goddamn sweatshirt off. And like they just they don't want to. And like, these are the kids that go to the pool and never take their t-shirt off. And do you, do you, I feel like that's for me. I feel like it's, there's the, I feel like you got to work on the mental thing first. Absolutely. I mean, like I got, I got to try to get them to be comfortable who they are. And like the easy, the more comfortable you are with you are, and then you want to get leaner because you want to get leaner, not for something else. And, and, and that, that oh, we're going to go all over in it today. I can feel it already. Cause <laughs> I, it, this, this makes me th I'd like in power lifters, you know, a lot of power lifters have horror stories. Yeah. They, they started lifting cause they were fat or because they got picked on or cause their dad beat them. And then and I think, I think one of the reasons if you go to the top highest level, they're cool as hell. Mm -hmm. The guys you would think would be the scariest are actually the nicest. And yes. I think it's because they realized at some point they're like, wait a minute, I'm one of the strongest guys in the world and I'm still shy and I'm still a little embarrassed and it didn't change anything. And that's when they actually kind of start working on themselves. Yeah, I think self-work, I guess you can say it's trending now or whatever, but I think a lot of us realize, especially as we get older, like, oh, we are a product of how we were raised and what we were exposed to. And it's our responsibility to be able to confront those things and the way that we react to stuff and our own insecurities and shit. I've been there. I've walked through the summer with a hoodie on because I was uncomfortable with how I looked. And people are like, aren't you hot? And I'm like, shut up. Like, don't yeah. talk to me, you know, like, yes, I'm hot. It's called a sweatshirt for a reason. OK, <laughs> like I would just like make things up. Um, but it, it it's something that you have to discuss openly because it helps people realize not only are they not alone, but there are ways to work through that to be able to like what what you look like and why I get like trolled a lot for what I look like. And I've even had people say, like, you have to soften your look. And I'm like, for who? I mean, I like being lean. I like looking jacked. I 
don't think I should change based off of other people's opinions on me, especially if they coach with us for how I look. I can demonstrate that I can look a certain way. I can get others to look a certain way, but I also like walking around like this. So don't worry about what it takes for me to look like this. How about worry about yourselves? But we do tend to project what we're insecure about or what we can't do onto others, which guys will experience if they do go through a change in their lifestyle or their health. The people around them may be triggered or they may just say things to kind of try to derail guys from doing that. Yeah, I think that's totally true. That was one I kind of goes on to one of the things I did want to talk about because I've talked to other high level athletes about this too. Like who you surround yourself with actually matters a lot. And the, and the older I get and the more I because when I was lifting, I didn't really coach people other than my direct team uh, and in seminars and stuff. And now I'm coaching a lot more people. And so I'm kind of looking at things differently. <laughs> And I remember I had Nick Best, the strongman on, and we were talking about like surrounding yourself with your friends. And he's like, I don't have a lot of friends that train heavy, but he goes, my friends do know what I do and they respect it. So he was like, if, you know, they'll call me up and go, Hey, we're going to go see this concert on Friday night. You want to go? And he's like, no, I got to train heavy on Saturday. So I got to be home early. And they're like, Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. You know, where other people are like, Oh, come on, you can do that. Come on. What's one drink. You'll still be able to train tomorrow. And it's like, you don't understand. And you got to, kind of weed those people out of your life. And I've always been the same way. Not all, most of my, probably less of my friends like work out than do. Yeah. But all of my friends know what I do and know how important it is to me. So they're like, oh, that's cool, man. My friends are more like, Jesus, Chad, that's so awesome. You're that dedicated. That's crazy. I don't know how you do that. And I'm like, well, I, just, I like it. So it's not that hard for me. <laughs> <laughs> But they respect it, which is important. Whereas if someone's questioning you or constantly on you and giving you shit for it, I'm not sure they're really that good of a friend to you. So it, yeah, I I mean, <laughs> this brings me back to a story. You know, Matt Rhodes. Oh, yes, I know Matt. So I love Matt. <laughs> I love Matt, too. Matt worked at the same commercial gym that I did in Greenwich. So like picture Matt working with these like little old ladies and stuff. He and, actually told me about that. Oh, did he? It's mm -hmm. so funny. So like, you know, this is in my 20s. So we would like everybody who worked at the gym would go out on the weekends together and drink our face off. And we'd be like, Matt, come on. And he'd be like, no, I got a squat on Saturday. And we're like, fine. Like, you know, but so many people just didn't understand that. Like, OK, like I'm working out Saturday, too. Like they don't understand the level that he was at and you know what his goals are and stuff mm -hmm. and you're right there's people that will respect it and move on or people who would be like you know come on dude or they'll they'll tell guys come on you can come out for a few beers or you can eat that or eating that won't kill you yeah it's not going to kill somebody of course and maybe they can control the amount that they eat however it's more of the concept that they are on a path where if they derail from that or deviate from what they know they can do, it throws them off psychologically. Mm -hmm. They, they just don't feel like they're uh, being, they're accomplishing what they want to do. So it's not so much the concept of a, like, yeah, you can eat that and it probably won't do much to you. However, it's the fact that you gave in to that or that you're really trying to get to that next level level and whatever journey you're on that you just don't want to deviate. It's okay. Like, People don't have a problem with me when I go out with them and I'm drinking a diet soda and they're drinking alcohol. Like if anything, they have issues with it. I don't. Yeah. And why should they? Why would they care? That's, that's I, I, what's always baffled me. Yeah. It makes them more uncomfortable. Like I could have fun. I mean, I, I think I'm a good time sober. I, I don't have to drink. If I do drink, it's like very rare and for very special occasion or for a photo shoot, which I've talked about. But like, I, I don't feel the need because it literally takes me out for the next day or so where I just feel horrible. And it's not worth giving up an entire day of what could be productive time for my business or in the gym mm -hmm. just to be able to drink. And I don't like socially drink. When I drink, I want to get drunk. So, well, what, I mean, honestly, what is the point of drinking? Like, <laughs> yeah, like I, I, it's not like I like, oh, my God, this tastes so amazing. It tastes taste in diet soda is just as good for me.
That's it. The, oh, this is interesting. The, I've always, I didn't have a whole lot of times where I drank, drank a lot because my brother's just a mess and an alcoholic. And I grew up with that. So I was kind of a control freak. And I'm like, I don't want to get to that point. And then, so I didn't even start drinking until I was like 20. And then I drank a little bit here and there. And then I would stop and then I would drink a little bit here and there. But yeah, I've always thought none of this tastes that good that I couldn't drink something that doesn't have alcohol and tastes as good. But I used to always think like all my buddies would want to go out and drink. And they're like, I'm like, why do we have to drink? They're like, well, I want to talk to girls. And I'm like, so you have to drink to talk to the girl. Maybe you need to work on talking to girls. So you don't need to drink to do it. And if you need to drink to have fun, are you really having fun? Yeah. And that's the way I always, I always looked at it that way. One thing you said that it was interesting, and I and this is another thing I thought about <clears throat> on my walk this morning. There was a point where I was a super heavyweight. So I was like three, my highest was 397. I competed at 385. It takes a ton of calories for me to stay that big. So I, I ate and I, ha I hated eating, absolutely hated eating for a long time. And then when I decided I wasn't going to compete at that level anymore and I started dropping, I cleaned up all my eating. And there would be a point where like emotionally maybe just had a shit day or something. And I'm like, man, I'm, I'm just going to go grab some food. I, I don't have time. I'm just going to grab food at home and I'm going to eat this. And then I would eat it and I would get that little endorphin rush. But five minutes later, I'm like, okay, now I just feel like crap because now I'm going, well, that just took you off your plan. Like, really? Was it worth that That feeling of five or ten minutes? And on my walk this morning, I, I realized I do a lot of things in my life that I don't realize till later why I did it. Yeah. And I was thinking on my walk today, I would go, you know what? I would give up if you put me in a room and said, here's two boxes of zebra cakes, or you can get a hug from your great niece. I would take that hug over those cakes any day of the week. Cause it'll give me the same rush and it's going to last a whole lot longer. Totally. And so I think it comes down to making the subconscious conscious. So whatever route you want to go, is it the devil on your shoulder? Is it your shadow? Is it your ego? It's making, being aware of, of those feelings so that before you start eating it, you go, well, wait a minute. What am I going to feel like afterwards? No, I do have time. I can go home. It doesn't take that long to make a healthy meal. Like, and I, I think that's a big part for a lot of people. And I think on their, on the journey of getting healthy, like you said about derailing, I think you can, once you're good, you know, once you reach a certain level, you can probably have that go out that one meal and control your portions and have a little bit of bad, but now you're in shape and your body can actually utilize and burn everything better. Yeah. Then if you're, if you're already fat and you're out of shape, it, it, it's, you're not going to go through those calories as, as well. No, that that's huge. And we do have guys that struggle with that where uh, I, I wouldn't say it's binge eating, but they're prone to doing something like that when they're really stressed. Yes. And quite often they are great throughout the week and maybe they have a very high stress job. And then come the weekend, it's like they have no control and they just blow out and maybe it's like 5,000 calories. So what I do with those guys is actually increase their calories throughout the entire week. And I tell them there's no difference between you eating 5,000 calories on Saturday or spreading that 5,000 out over the course of the week. So you can nail your workouts, actually have enough like fuel to get through that and build the muscle that you're looking to build. And it helps satiate you and kind of curbs cravings. Cause they're so like, I just want to drop weight or, you know, I want to look a certain way. Why aren't we going lower with calories? Well, you're already at 1800 through the week and you're at 5,000 on the weekend. We just got to bring that up and get you to a point where you do not give in to a lot of these cravings or stress is not the trigger for you to just go ham on a pizza. And it works well because their weight actually stabilizes and they feel better in the gym. They feel better overall. They don't have these super high stress periods because they're not white knuckling everything through the entire week. So 
it, it's something tough to deal with. But like with the mental aspect, I tell them you will fuck up. It will happen when they do. I'm like, OK, what was the trigger? Oh, it was just a crap day at work. You know, my kids were screaming and then I got home and I just face planted the pizza. And I'm like, OK, so now next time we know when you get home, you might be faced with a trigger food because if you have kids, you can't really all, always control that. Stop for five seconds to breathe and think your way through this. Mm -hmm. You can have a slice of pizza, but you don't need to eat the entire one. You can stop yourself. You can still indulge, but you don't have to overindulge because you know that feeling after. And they're like, well, I have to make it up with cardio the next day or under eat. I'm like, no, you just you can't erase what just happened. You get up the next day, you move on. And you eat normally and it takes practice, but yeah, it's a thing. That's an interesting point too, where people try to either pin it down to one day or do the other day. Like I've seen people do that in training. Well, I missed training yesterday, so I'm going to train twice today. And I've <laughs> actually done this when I was a kid. Uh, it's like, it doesn't work that way, man. And then like, you're like, yeah, your nutrition, if you're, if you're eating good five days a week and then you have two that are completely off the rails, it, it's still the same thing. Yeah. So it's why not? Why that. not spread it out? Get it, make it healthier food, less stress eating food. So that, that brings me to another point here. Um, <clears throat> I know with women, maybe this isn't a woman and man thing now that I think about it, but people are like, Oh, I want to lose weight. So they cut their calories insanely stupid low. <laughs> And I can't stand when people do that. I'm like, all you're doing is, in my mind, you're screwing up your metabolism. You're starving yourself. You're going to go back to it and it's going to be worse at some point. And I can't figure out why people continually think that it's less calories. Less, you just keep cutting calories. Just keep cutting calories. Because that's all they know. Um, and it is not a woman or man thing. Like I, a lot of guys that come to us are doing this. And they, because they're taught like, you know, oh, I'm not hard enough and I'm not suffering enough. So they make themselves suffer unnecessarily harder. So when they cut calories that drastically, they just feel like shit and they have no sex drive. They can't perform in the gym. They can't perform in bed. They just like overall, they feel so awful. And they're like, well, I guess I need to add like a rock or I need to, you know, go harder. And they're just oblivious to actually what their entire output is. Because cutting calories initially, yes, that will work very well until it doesn't. So the answer to that is not to cut so drastically to start in a mild deficit because you want to eat as much as you can for as long as you can and still see progress. So a lot of that comes into play. They're not eating enough protein, which we know protein is very satiating. You can pretty much overeat protein. It's not going to be stored as body fat. And you're not going to have crazy cravings if you're eating enough carbs. A lot of guys avoid carbs. They're afraid of carbs. They don't eat mm -hmm. enough carbs. And that's really what's driving a lot of the cravings too. Because when you ramp up cortisol, which is a stress hormone, because you're under eating and overtraining, it causes cravings. So what opposes cortisol? Insulin. So eating carbohydrates to use as fuel, because it's a great fuel for your body to use, kind of curbs the cravings when you have enough carbs, you know that like unless you're dieting really strict for a photo shoot or getting on stage, there's no reason to be suffering in the way that they do to themselves. So more often than not, we actually take training down and take food up, which seems ass backwards to what you're supposed to do. But they trust the process enough to know that we're not going to make them look sloppy. We're going to keep their shape and do this in an intelligent way because truly changing your body composition is not a two week process. It's years. Yes. So looking at it as a long-term like adventure versus like, I got to do this by this date in the state <clears throat> that, okay. Like fat loss is a lot quicker than muscle growth. However, if, if you don't want to look skinny fat or feel soft, you have to be patient. So it, it's definitely quick to lose fat. We can do that. No problem. But to grow muscle, you can't rush that process. Just like cutting calories excessively over what you need to is not going to rush fat loss and eating in a surplus excessively more than you actually need to is not going to supercharge muscle growth. Yeah, I tell people all the time, I go, it, didn't, it took you 10 to 15 years to get in the shape you're in, meaning overweight or whatever. 
like it's not going to reverse in a couple months. No. And when you actually get there, it's a lot easier. And I also think um, even uh, actually Vinny Dizenzo, one of Matt Rhodes' good friends, um, he was a super heavyweight. Now he's really lean and looks great and he's in his 50s. But he intentionally did it very, very slow. And like I'm, I was down to 285 till I got COVID. And then for the first time in my life after COVID, it was hard to lose weight again. And I put a ton of weight on during COVID. Yeah. But getting back down, my normal body weight's anywhere from probably 220 to maybe 270. So my goal is like, if I'm not competing, there's no reason to be this big. So I want to get back down to like 285, but be leaner. So yeah. I was like, I can't just do this overnight. Like my body needs to do it slowly. And that way, when I get there, I can stay there. And I feel like if you do it quickly, your body's going to want to go back. It's, it, I feel almost like your your body has a memory. And I, I have no science to prove that this is true. It's just what it seems with me. So like the slower I do it and the steadier I do it, the, the easier it is to stay that way for me. And if I drop, because I used to drop after a competition, I hated eating so much. I'd drop 20 or 30 pounds fast but it would come right back. Yeah. And it, so now I'm like, no, this is my lifestyle. I'm 52 and I plan on being in shape the rest of my life. So I want to get down as lean and get lean, but be able to stay not like, I don't need to be super lean. I don't need a six pack. I don't even care. Um, but I want to get down and stay lean and healthy and not have to fight with it. Yeah. And the slower you do it, the easier it is to maintain because the process to get there is way harder than it is to live there. So yes. li living a leaner lifestyle is way easier because people ask me all the time, like, how are you eating Oreos and cereal and all this stuff? And I'm like, you do w really well on carbs when you have lower body fat. Mm -hmm. And I could also get away with less training. I've trained the least I have in the last two months due to traveling and being sick. And I can't get rid of this damn cold. And I'm training like once or twice a week. I would have lost my mind a couple of years ago, but I'm like, I'm cool. And I, I sit around 56, 57 kilos. And I used to hover around like 130, 135, which is 60, 62 kilos. Like I'm the leanest I've ever been. I feel, I don't feel great now, but like I, I realize, oh, it's just minimal stimulus is all I need just to maintain this. I can still get away with eating what I want and it's nice living here versus fluctuating, you know, rebounding and, and yo-yoing all that weight is what happens when you do it drastically. I am on year seven with my coach, Luke Lehman for a reason. Like it's taken me seven years to actually realize, Oh yeah, I could do really well on very high carbs. Seven years. Like, even me, who I know what to do for others, I've been yeah. doing this over 20 years. But when it comes to yourself, like you can't negotiate with yourself. And I'm like, well, I'm special. I, I have to do this. I have to do this. And like I said to him, like a few That's weeks ago, that ego I was like, and that shadow and all those things. Yeah. I was like, Luke, I could miss training and I'm OK. And he's like, thank God. And and I'm like, but I, I just don't like missing. I love training. Mm -hmm. So I was never OK with missing it. But I realize I can. And even when I went snowboarding, I ate like 3000 calories both days because that was literally my output and I lost weight. And I was like, yo, this is cool. But I, the process to get there is a lot harder. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I think it's important to let people know because like a lot of people during the process are like, I don't want to live this way the rest of my life. And it's like, well, you don't really have to. You don't, you don't understand that once your body is in shape and functions well, it's going to deal with a lot of stuff differently than what it does now. Totally. And like with our coaching approach, like we look at it from a body composition point of view. So if, if somebody is over, I would say 15, but like 15, 20% body fat, probably have to go low carb, do a lot of low intensity aerobic work, which men hate, mm -hmm. but it's not forever. I'm like, listen, we got to take out al alcohol because it's just going to expedite the process. We have to go lower carb. We have to get that body fat off because body fat is the most inflammatory tissue. Once you get leaner, we will start ramping the carbs up. And I, I did this recently with one of my guys who wanted to lose body fat. He's not overly uh, overweight. He was more like a skinny fat. I was like, dude, I still have to lean you out. And 
I had him pretty low calorie and he was like, I don't know if I can do this forever. I'm like, you don't have to. And he got to the point where you and I both know where someone just looks super flat, yeah. like, yo, I need to pump up some carbs. So we, we got him lean enough and I was like, all right, I'm going to increase your carbs. You'll probably drop weight. He's like, whatever. Like he didn't believe it. He's dropped like four pounds since we did this the last three weeks. And he's like, this is so weird. I'm like, yeah, because you're actually using the carbs a lot more in your training because we've gotten rid of the inflammation in the body fat. So people spin their wheels when they have a lot of fat to lose because they are like, okay, low carb works. I'm going to stay low carb. And then that doesn't work. And then they wonder why. Well, I got here low carb. Yeah, but now you're in a different physiologic environment where you can handle more carbs. Carbs taste really good. They're the best fuel for you. Why would you not want to eat them? Yes. You know, so. It's, it's the same thing with 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 strength <laughs> training. I don't, I, I will help people with their nutrition, but I'm not, I don't know like nutrition on the level that you guys know. I know enough the basics. Mm -hmm. But with strength training is my thing. And it's the same thing with strength training. People want to go, well, this got me to a 300 pound bench. Well, it doesn't necessarily mean that's what's going to get you to four. And you're always going to be adapting and changing as your body adapts and changes. It's funny though, that yeah. I have one of my biggest problems with training people and especially guys is trying to get them to train less. Yeah. They hate it. And for a while, one of my questions I would ask all of my guests, and this would this was an interesting one between my male strength athletes and my female strength athletes. I would go, if you could train less in in time and days per week and get stronger, would you do it? Almost every male said, nope, no way. And I'm like, wait a minute, like you're going to get stronger and you're going to do less. They're like, no, I don't, I wouldn't do it. And almost every female went, oh yeah, of course. Yeah. That's and I'm so like, funny. how you, like you want to be a power lifter. Isn't your whole thing about lifting more weight? They're like, yeah, but I like to train. And I'm like, yeah. okay, you guys are just fucking my logic all up in my head. And I've had, I've had so many clients like in, I have, I, I need to be better at separating this when I talk to people because there's the people that go to the gym, 24 hour fitness or whatever, like you need to do more. You're not stimulating shit. Right. Like you're wearing your gloves and your socky, your toe shoes and your <laughs> pad. You need to train more. You're not stimulating <laughs> growth. And then there's, and then it's like, there's these two ends. And then there's the other end who the guys that just beat the shit out of themselves. Mm -hmm. And every time things don't go the way they want, their very first solution is do more. I need yeah. to do more. I need to do more. And when I talk to him, I'm like, so have you ever tried doing less? No, it won't work. I'm like, so you've never tried it and you know it won't work. How do you know it won't work if you never tried it? <laughs> and then when I have um, guys, I'll have guys, I did a consultation with this one guy. And because his coach told him, because he was ready to quit powerlifting. And his, his coach is like, you need to call Chad. You need to do a consultation with Chad. And basically, I'm like, dude, you have you have a hard job. You're training all the time. You need to back off, man. So we reworked his program, and he's texting me like, dude, what is this voodoo bullshit you got me doing? Like, I'm PR all the time, and I'm only training heavy twice a week. I go, yeah, you're actually finally recovering. And Mind I blowing. I think a lot of men, like women, are better. I could tell women all kinds of shit, and they're like, okay, I'll do it. Men are like, no. And, but I think men, even in, even no matter what range we're talking, I think most men, I'm like, dude, if you're, if you have low tests, you're probably in your thirties, forties, fifties, maybe. If you were to give me two heavy sessions a week, like an hour, maybe an hour and a half, generally I keep it under an hour and 15 minutes. And then you give me two sessions in the gym that are lighter, probably 30 minutes. And then you walk 30 minutes every day. I think you will see massive gains. Of course, eating clean on top of that. Where they're like, oh, well, if I want to lose weight, I got to train seven days a week. I'm like, no, what? Who told you that? Like, where where did you get that information? <laughs> so I think a lot of guys, and I think this this is interesting too. Like, if somebody wants to lose weight, they're like, well, what did the Mr. Olympia, what, what's his diet? I want to do that diet. And I'm like, but you're not Mr. Olympia. Dude, you, your body fat's at like 39%. Like you don't need to diet like that. You need to start focusing on small stuff. 
Yes. Uh, that That is a, a thing to really lay into them about. Um, but what I tell them, I'm like, all right, so you feel you need to train six to seven days a week. How is that working for you now? Because you came to us for a reason. So I expect you to listen to what we say. And and sometimes you have to present it in a way where it's like, well, yeah, you're trying to do the same thing over and over. It's clearly not working. Most of our guys are on a four day split, like an upper lower split. Mm -hmm. If they really whine, I will give them a fifth arm and ab day because right. they like that. Like I get what it's like to have fun being in the gym. I love being in the gym. I tell my coach, I'm like, give me two hour workouts. I don't care. Like, I just love being there. I will do that. But myself, like when I'm training regularly, it's like four days a week. That's enough for most of earth, I would say. Yes. Um, you know, if you want to split up, like you have, you know, chest day and back day and whatever, like that may take six days a week, but it's not these overly intense sessions. We don't really find guys do well on that. They actually do really well in the upper lower splits. And coming from seven, six to seven days a week of like two a days and then high intensity work and all this stuff, when you calm them down and you give them four days of hard training and then something low intensity like walking or just Netflix mindless cardio, then they actually do really well and they get out of their head and they realize, oh, I can prioritize time to like my family or my work or other things versus training. So you can do that. You can actually do four days and do really well, but it, it's tough. I have, I have a lot of guys that have fought me on that, but again, you're here for a reason and we have to do things differently. Yeah, you, well. You're obviously hiring me because something's not working right. Now, why not listen to me? Yeah. Mike Menser has this story, an old story I heard of his where he was in the gym coaching one guy. And he kind of saw the corner of his other, this other guy's like listening to him. And he's like, I've seen him in the gym. He goes, the guy's been here for 10 years and he still lifts the same way. And so he coaches his guy. And the next day he comes in and the guy that was listening comes up and he goes, Mike, I, I was listening to everything you said. And it really makes a lot of sense. But I got one question for you. He's like, what will I do if I'm not in the gym every day for a couple hours? And Mike's like, um, read a book. <laughs> go for a bike ride, like spend some time with your girlfriend. Like the world's your oyster, dude. Yeah. But I, but th I agree. There's a lot of guys like that. It's kind of funny. You say the upper and lower body because I've always kind of wondered about the whole bodybuilding split stuff, because to me, you're still taxing your body. So the recovery process, it doesn't matter what body part you work, your body has to recover. And so when I started training, like more of my non powerlifter people, and I have I have two I have a couple and they're seventy five, and I train them the same way. It's like we have a bench press day, which is all your upper body, and then we have squat deadlift days, which are all your lower body. And I'm like that way we can hit your upper body, give you plenty of time to recover before your next session. Then we can hit the opposite, and then mm -hmm. you get recovery. And I've had really, really a good success with that. So it sounds pretty similar to what you're doing. Yeah, it, it's not like we take away all of that. Like, you know, one upper day has like a horizontal press, like the bench or and then the other one has more of a vertical. So mm -hmm. if they can't uh, do like a barbell strict press, then they maybe they can do a Viking press or a landmine press or they can use the football bar, whatever it is. And then same with the lower, it's usually a variation of the deadlift and a squat. So they still get that compound lift fun work in. And you could always pair that um, with a lot of the accessory stuff and just hit everything. And then obviously if there's asymmetries, you can do a lot of unilateral stuff. Mm -hmm. So when guys first start, if they have a lot of body fat to lose, usually they're on a total body three-day split. And then the other days they're doing a lot of cardio. And when I say a lot, it's very low intensity because the intensity is so low, you have to increase the volume. So maybe it's 45 to 60 minutes of like Netflix mindless cardio. Mm -hmm. uh, the more intense they go, then the shorter it can be, but we have to devote more time to getting the body fat off. So you're not doing cardio like this for the rest of your life, don't worry. But they tend to have come from doing body part splits six days a week with zero cardio. 
they're overweight. All right, we need to flip the script a little bit, get you on total body, which is going to help drive fat loss as well, because there's a metabolic component to it. And then add on a lot of the low intensity stuff. Then they start leaning out. Then when we get into some of the heavier, more hypertrophy dr uh, driven programs, then it works a lot better. So I'm really big on walking. I think everybody should walk. And a lot, I know there's a lot of people, that's not cardio. I go, uh, to me, it is. Go walk for an hour. Some people are so overweight. Like if they walk to their mailbox, that's cardio for them. Cool. Mm -hmm. You know, have at it. Now, there is an adaptation that occurs where it, it does get a little bit excessive if someone's like, well, I was walking 25,000 steps today. Okay. So we can probably cut that off around like 15,000 and then the rest you can make up in doing some other more intense cardiovascular mm -hmm. activity. But I mean, there's times like if you're dieting really hard, you don't really have the energy for that. So you may have to go very high in your walking because it really is the best. It's the most aerobic thing you can do. Yeah. That's that's interesting. I saw a meme the other day and this has been, it's been percolating in my head. And it was like a guy standing and there's two hallways and one says cut calories and one says increase, increase exercise. And I'm like, that's actually a really simple. And I'm a simplistic blue collar guy. So I like that. And I think most people, it's like, okay, your standard is cut three to 500 calories a day. Well, what if you just increase three to 500 calories of exercise? I would rather see someone let's, let's take your calories and, and change it to, clean, healthier food. And then let's add in 500 extra calories of exercise a day. Yeah. That, that is one way to achieve a deficit that people don't take into account because yes, you can lower calories and try that. You can add cardio and try that. However, what if you're just overall volume increased and then you just bring calories up? So not to match it, but so you're actually slightly under. Yeah. That's another way to do it. And that's actually a way to go back and forth so that if you have somebody who still wants to be very active, but they do want to actually improve their body composition, you can change the calories around and keep the output high. Mm -hmm. So they may be eating more than they would if they were just straight dieting and training less. Right. Yeah. There's different so ways about it. Do you, when you, when you're, when you're figuring out somebody's nutrition, like I've always been like, listen, if you if you really want to figure out your nutrition, we got to figure out your BMR. But the best way to do that is going to be for you to record calories for a couple of weeks. So I can actually see what you're really eating, you know, instead of just going to the BMR calculator thing. But a yeah. lot of people, a lot of people bitch about that. And I'm like, come on, do you really want to lose weight? I'm just asking you to give me recording <laughs> for a couple of weeks, man. <laughs> Yeah, we have all our clients have to log food for about a week so that we could see where they naturally fall. Yeah. And then we'll make changes. So we do have them log all of them. Um, and if they're not used to it, they get used to it because it is relatively easy. Like the we use chronometer and it learns what you input if you eat a lot of the same stuff. Um, and then if they're on the leaner side, I'll actually calculate their BMR on catch McCardle because the the default one is Mifflin St. Jor in most uh, apps. And that can underfeed people who are on the leaner side by about 200 calories. So I'll recalculate that. And then we have a starting point for them. And usually they're eating a lot more than they had when they came to us, but they feel better. And then they're starting to look better and everything. Mm -hmm. So do you figure, I always hear people, the, the debate of how many grams of protein per pound of body weight. Do you use that? Yes. So we use protein. We leverage it in a way where most people are at a gram per pound of body weight at least to start. Um, if someone is very overweight, obviously it's going to be very difficult to get like 350 grams of protein, nor is that really necessary. Very overweight people can actually live in a deficit for a lot longer than somebody who's on the leaner side. So if somebody is on the leaner side, they do have to be at least a gram per pound of protein. They can go more. So protein does have a high thermic effect. It burns calories just by you eating it. So you can use it kind of as a calorie funnel where you're actually burning calories just eating. 
And if they go into a deeper deficit where they're really trying to get like single digit body fat, we increase protein because that will help muscle retention. It'll help satiate satiation and also increase that thermic effect so that you don't have to drop calories so low. And I think a lot of people miss the mark on that unless they're in competitive athlete, like our jujitsu guys, I will keep their protein around a gram per pound and really pump the carbs because we'll, we'll want to delineate calories to as many carbs as possible to be able to execute in training. Yeah. I, Cause I always, I always, like you said, I've actually changed it kind of on what you were saying. But I always wondered, like, should you be figuring like grams for protein based on lean body weight or not? Or does it even matter? But I mean, like you said, you basically are. You're just going, this person's really overweight, so I'm not going to try to hit necessarily a gram. Yeah. Like, all right, what is our ideal body weight? Let's start there. But yeah. it's usually more than they're consuming when they come to us. And do you, I find, a, I think a lot of people when they lose weight, I think we might've hit this already, but they don't eat enough calories. How many calories do you eat a day? Uh, it's variable. Um, right now I, I don't have much of an appetite due to this lingering cold. So it's around like 1500, 1600, but what's it normally it, at upward like 2100 ish. Yeah. And you, you're not a big person. No. I'm 125 pounds, five foot three. So I, I'm pretty small. And like, I'm also a, a major under eater. Like I've never been a big, like, oh my God, I have to have this. I have to have this. Like, I'm so weird. I'm not the model, but yeah, I can diet very easily. Uh, bulking is very difficult for me. And my bulking is like most people's dieting. So, but even that at 125 pounds, if you're normally eating over 2000, I'll bet you most women that weigh 150 are probably eating way less than that. I've, I've had women come in and they're eating like 13 or 1400. Yeah. And I'm like, there's, that's not good for you. And I have to diet on that because I'm small. Like if, when you're a small person, like you're going to be dieting towards that number and it's not crazy, but you don't want to live there. Yeah. And, and that's where a lot of people try to live women, especially. So with you started uh, the Silverback Summit, yes, which which is growing, and I and I, I've, I've watched a couple clips about that, and I find that really fascinating. Um, as somebody who suffered from severe depression and suicidal stuff, and written about it, and been very open about it, and talked about it in podcast, and uh, I wrote a lot of stuff for Lead about depression. I find that that's something that men need. Like the reason I continue to talk about depression is because I, I don't know if it's the universe that gave me this gift or what it is, but I can talk about it openly, even if it I can have tears rolling down my face and I'll keep talking about it. And I, I feel like that helps a lot of people just in some respects to know that they're not the only one. And it seems like at your summit, you're hitting like hormone replacement and nutrition and training and dealing with being a man in society. It seems like you're hitting all these different areas, which I think is, it's just huge. It's huge. Thank you. Yeah. Silverback Summit is my baby. And, you know, I, I'd realized there's a lot of courses or events that are women only, but there's not so many male only events that are centered around the education that we provide in a very unfiltered way where it's not restricted by a medical organization or, you know, any other organization. So I wanted to bring together like this is the truth about hormones and TRT. This is what you're you should know about business as a man. This is what you should know about fitness, nutrition, all my trusted experts in my world but in one room. And we talk openly about like erectile dysfunction and depression and mental health and like all these things where what I did not expect was the overwhelming feedback of the guys to be like, this is my family. This is the community I needed. These are the guys that I wanted to be around because there's no judgment there. And everybody is able to 
feel like they can express themselves and they're not alone. And they found guys and there's friendships being built and made. And it just, it made me so happy to see that. Cause then I would see all these collaborations on podcasts and I'm like, they met at Silverback, they met at Silverback. And like, people have no idea about these things being discussed unless you actually bring it to their attention. So I wanted to create that like safe space for guys, but also this is a real fucking good time because we know how to have fun and we can joke around and nobody has to feel like they are going to offend somebody. And it's just a great group of dudes. Yeah. So that's I happening think... again uh, in November in Phoenix, November 15th through 16th. I hope you come. One of my experiences, we can definitely talk about that. Um, One of my experiences when I first, I was like, I was the closest I've ever been to, to putting a bullet in my head. And at one point I thought about my, I thought about my niece who was young at the time, but old enough to understand it. And I thought if I do this, it's going to affect her life forever. Mm. So it's kind of like shit or get off the pot, get busy living or get busy dying, make a fucking decision. And so I've wrote this whole, I wrote exactly what I was going through and it was on my training log on elite. And I sat and stared at it for two or three hours. And eventually I just went, fuck it, enter and went and went and laid down. And then in the morning when my alarm went off, I went, oh my God, what did I do? I'm like, I'm going to lose my sponsors. People are going to think I'm freaking crazy. And the phone rings and it's one of my main sponsors. And I'm like, oh, shit, here we go. As soon as I answered the phone, he goes, you got the biggest fucking balls of any dude I've ever met in my entire life. That was <laughs> awesome. And then I, it was just all these great responses after that. And it, I kind of like went, dude, I need to keep doing this. Like, I need to keep talking about this because so many people, I, I don't really remember getting that many bad responses. Yeah. Yeah. It's now, I was, and I go, there's, there's more. And then what amazed me too, is the people that started opening up to me who I thought, I thought, dude, this guy's got the world by the balls, man. This dude's making money. He's got his family. He's got this. And I mean, I got people telling me, I got guys telling me that their wife doesn't know they're dealing with this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? So like, you're hiding this 20 worse than feeling this way is hiding it. Like that's exhausting. I've done that. Like, this is crazy. We got to talk about this and, and get this information out there. And and I think I've done a really good job of um, taking control of this. And not to say that what I did is going to work for everybody, but damn, I at least want to help and tell them, here's what I did. If it doesn't help you, maybe it leads you to a path where you can get better because this is not, it doesn't have to be this way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you show like it, it's very commendable that you're able to grab that by the reins and control it because more guys need to hear stories like that and need to know that they're not the only ones. Men are taught to internalize these things. Mm -hmm. They don't talk about it socially or openly. It's not locker room talk, whereas like women are much more open about their struggles and they talk about it in a social circle. Guys don't. And no, now- more than ever, guys are being encouraged to be open about this amongst each other and with their friends. And like there are guys talking about that openly at Silverback. And it's just like, like you said, then all these other guys are like, shit, me too. Like I'm dealing with this too. Like there, there, there's that communication factor that has kind of gone away since not only COVID, but just with the technology and everything, like no one talks to each other anymore. And you have no idea what is going on in somebody's life because they're not going to tell you. They're just going to put forward facing on social media what they think people want to see. Mm -hmm. It's not the raw truth. Sometimes it is. And people have gotten better about showing that. But it's always usually the high highlight reel because that's what they feel they have to put forward. But the they, reason uh... why, why people act a certain way. Maybe somebody ghosts you. Maybe somebody doesn't want to come to a social function or maybe somebody attacks you online. There's a reason for that. There's something they're going through that they're not telling you. And having that, like holding that space for somebody to know that, I find it's huge because there's all times where I've just, I haven't understood why hasn't this person gotten back to me or 
why did they act that way? Why did they do that? And you realize it has more to do with them than actually you. Yes. And maybe they, they don't like you and you're a piece of shit and they don't just want to avoid you. Fine. But like most of the time, it's because they've internalized something that yeah. we have no idea. Well, I mean, how many times have you ever heard anyone who committed suicide? Have you ever heard the people around him go, oh, yeah, I knew it was I knew he was struggling. It's always exactly. I had no idea. He seemed fun. He seemed nice. Mm -hmm. And I had when. I'm I'm I love BMX bikes and I love BMX. So Dave Mira was like the godfather of anything on a bike. He was just unbelievable. And he was this great guy. Everybody loved him. He did tons of stuff for his kids, uh, and his kids, his wife and his kids, but, but just kids in general. Like before he committed suicide, he was opening a new park uh, in the city he lived in. So when he killed himself, everybody's like, oh, my God, like I, I thought he was. And it's like, I know like it that hit me hard because I know what that's like. And it's like he had nobody to talk to. He couldn't even talk to his wife. So 24-7, he has to be Dave Mira that everybody loves. And I go, that takes a toll, man. <laughs> like, eventually, you're just like, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's like, dude, we lost somebody amazing because he didn't have anybody to talk to. Yeah, it, it it's sad and it's tough. And I hope more guys, you know, listening to this realize, like, it's okay to be open about that. Because vulnerability is huge. And if they can show that side, it doesn't mean they're weak. They're actually stronger for being able to admit certain things. And there's solution and support out there for them. Yeah. I, I, I've had people ask me how I can do it. And I go, because I think I'm a badass, honestly. And I go, if I am that badass, why can't I talk about what I really feel? Yeah. But I think the thing with that is, too, is I think there's expressing it and finding out finding out somebody else is going through it that helps, but they're still, okay, what are you going to do? Like, what yeah. are you going to do to fix it? How are you going to get control of this? And it's like, for me, depression is something I'll probably always deal with. It's probably always going to be there every now and then because I have some really severe sleep problems. And I, tr I did a post on my Instagram the other day because I, when I decided to do Instagram, I'm like, I'm not going to be that person that posts everything great. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be that person that posts everything horrible either. Like right. I want to give a good view of my life where most days are really good. I love my life. My life's awesome. But I have days and and I had a bad sleep spell and I did a little post where it's like, hey, today's like I know I can I woke up and I could feel that little bit of depression nagging on me. And I had to consciously go, OK, I don't want this. I don't want this to happen. What do I need to adjust in my life? How do I need to look at it? I really got to be conscious of the subconscious today. The depression is going to try to make me feel all these things. And mm -hmm. I have to know that it's the depression. And I don't have to feel those things. And that's, that's one of the things I'd like to teach more people is how to take control of that and go, so what? So you deal with this. To me, it's a bonus. The fact that I suffer from depression, I haven't had any suicidal issues in I don't know, like 10 years now, probably. It's awesome. But going through all those experiences made me who I am. And it, it's allowing me to help people. So the way I see it, it it's all good. Every Thank experience you. I have is good and beneficial. And it starts with that first conversation. I think it, I can kind of equate it to like when you first meet somebody and you connect on something like, if I sat next to you on a plane and I didn't know you and I'd be like, oh, you know, do you, are you an athlete or what's up? And you'd be like, I'm a powerlifter. Oh, my God, I love powerlifting. Like that feeling when you connect on a common thing or like mm -hmm. for me recently, I just got into nicotine pouches, which apparently everyone's been doing like for years, a lot of powerlifters. So anytime I meet someone who has who likes Zen, I'm like, oh, my God, like you're, it's just like the culture. Like you're into that too. Oh, cool. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you know what it's like to get this flavor and that and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like there's that immediate connection. So imagine somebody's like, hey, I really struggle with my body dysmorphia. Dude, me too, bro. Like there's that common connection. But if you don't know, you can't have that. But it's a great feeling to know that you're not the only one because mm -hmm. it's human <laughs> nature to want to be understood, you know? So 
it's like thinking of the unique things about you that if somebody else is the same way, it's like, oh my God. Like I love mint chocolate chip ice cream. Not a lot of people like mint chocolate chip. So that's like a unique skill to like that in my mind. But yeah. I actually, I do like mint chocolate chip ice cream. Um, you reminded me of a story. I had one of my friends, <laughs> massive, huge guy. Um, we were talking and he trained at this very popular powerlifting gym just created all kinds of animals. He, we were talking and he's like, man, he goes, I have to go to this other gym on like Wednesdays to train my biceps. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Why? He goes, cause if I do it at the regular gym, they all make fun of me cause I'm training biceps. And he's like, but I feel like my arms are getting smaller all the time. And I'm like, you are, you're literally huge. Like you are one of the bigger human beings I've ever met in my life. And he's like, yeah, but I feel little. <laughs> if you want <laughs> extreme examples watch generation irons movie bigger exia that that will mm -hmm. make you realize like oh okay i mean it's i don't think i don't think a lot of people understand that guys have the same thing as every as women do we i would say we're more in reverse like we don't ever feel like we're big enough or strong enough oh i have clients all the time that they're like i uploaded new pics i look like shit and i'm like you have a 12 pack Please describe said shit. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Like, but we're, we're the biggest critics. Like my men's coaching group uh, that I called boners and biceps. It's a four month coaching group. So, and I only took like eight guys and I asked them yesterday, we're, we're about four or five weeks in. And I was like, you know, can I use your progress photos for social media? I want your guys permission. Seven out of eight were like, Yes, but I don't think there's much to look at. Mind you, I have pointed out on Loom the tremendous progress they've already made. Now, in, with my integrity, I never post photos that are less than three months apart. And we're not at the three-month mark yet. And I'm like, you guys, we still have a lot of time. But holy shit, I put side-by-sides for them. And it's dramatic already the way they're looking. But no one ever sees it because we're our worst critics. Even at my leanest, I can pick it apart and see things that, you know, I don't like. And then people will be like, you're fucking crazy, Allie. But that's how we all are. I Yeah, we're definitely like that. I think for me, it's interesting because with my depression, I kind of learned early on. Like there were literally there's literally mornings where I'll get up and look in the mirror and I see the elephant man. Like, I think I'm the ugliest, most hideous person in the world. And I, and I, to the point now where I go, Chad, you didn't feel this way yesterday. You're probably not going to feel this way tomorrow. Like something's going on in your head. So don't pay attention to it today. But I'm more with like, I would break a world record and be like, yes. And then like two minutes later, I'm like, to my training partners, I'm like, hey, was I tight enough? Did I sit back enough? And they're like, dude, you, you just broke the world record. Like stop beating yourself up. And I'm like, yeah. no, but I can do more. Like it's, and I know that it's never going to be enough for me. And that's okay. As long as I have find like some area of happiness with it. But yeah, I think for guys and people, I I don't know. I think some people don't have that though. I think again, that's a split. I think there's a lot of people that are perfectly happy sitting on the couch, not doing nothing. Amen. Good for them. I can't do that. I can't do it. I can't understand it. And I think that, I think that, like, because I'm, I'm always, I like, I, I wish 315 was the average bench press in the world. Like, I want everyone to be in some sort of decent shape. Because I think even the people that aren't now, I think if they got there, they would find a drive and find a reason to be in shape. I think I think a lot of people... Because we're humans and our ability to adapt is so amazing that it's also a curse at the same time. Like a POW prisoner gets used to it. Yeah. Well, that's the norm. And I think with guys, a lot of guys, we beat ourselves up and we live, we're overtrained all the time, but it becomes normal to us. So we don't even know what it feels like to feel good anymore. 
Yeah. And I've experienced that with a lot of my clients because one of my biggest things is first to assess, is this the person I have to push or is this the person I have to need to pull back? And there was one point where I found my clients, I found like three of my clients talking to each other and I came up on them and they didn't see me. And this was after they had all been training with me for six or seven months. And they're like, hey, do you remember when Chad first um, asked us if we were overtraining and we all said no? They're like, we're stronger than we've ever been. And every one of us feels better than we've ever felt. And they're like, maybe he was right. And I'm like, hell yeah, I was right. And I heard you say that. (laughs) That's awesome. I love that. But I think we get into that phase. And so I think people, a lot of people go too far the other way where they don't do shit. And they're like, no, I feel fine. I feel normal. And it's like, no, you probably feel lethargic and shitty. You just don't know it because you don't know what it feels like. So if you could somehow get them to start exercising, there's going to be a point where they go, hey, you know what? I feel pretty good. Like this eating healthier actually makes a difference. And this exercising actually makes a difference. And then if you can kind of get them hooked into that. Yeah, for sure. But it's hard. It's hard to get them hooked into that because people don't want to change. People don't like to change. (laughs) No, they don't. And that's why usually hiring a coach helps because you're being you're paying somebody to make you change. Yeah. You don't want to. to hold you accountable. Yeah. Which I think is big for a lot of people. So with, with, do you feel like, I feel like I've, I've, I've almost thought like I need to find the right psychologist. And when people want to work with me, I need to go, you need to go see that psychologist for a month and then we'll start training. Like I've really, I keep going back to the common ground or the common traits I see in the best athletes in the world is they believe in themselves. And so many people that I train, and even somebody who comes to me that wants to lose 20 pounds, they almost come in with this, uh, I'd like to lose 20 pounds, but I don't know. And it's like, dude, no. Like, no, we need to stop right now. You can and will lose 20 pounds. Like, you have the ability and I feel like so many people get held back from their from the mental side of it. Yet they're all they're worried about the training and they're worried about the nutrition and they're worried about this. And I'm like, dude, you got to get your brain right first. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that it's a hard thing to overcome because it, that is not our role, the psychological part. But we end up kind of morphing into being partly that. Mm-hmm. And and I think it's a, a lot of things that um, surround like mindset work and self work with men. They tend to dismiss it or feel like it's a weakness, and it could really be something that's actually very empowering for them. Super beneficial, even with like you know you said the the place that you used to work in New England. Like those business guys who deal with that kind of stress, like one of the best things they could probably do is is learn how to better deal with that stress and, yes. and take control of it. Because even if, and I, I did a post, I think I did one on, on this, my Courage Barbell channel the other day talking about, we're really only in the gym so many hours. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot, you know, even if you train a lot, you're maybe training 12 hours a week. That leaves 168 hours that week where you're outside the gym. And that is so, so much more important. So I was talking about like the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And if you're in, if you're in sympathetic all day long, your body's not recovering well at all. And even now talking to you, I'm thinking the same thing with your nutrition and how your body's digesting and absorbing everything. If you're in that state of high stress, and even if you go back to, I go back to like the the dinosaur days. Like the reason we had that is because you had to run and hunt, and you had when some when your stress came on, it was you got the adrenaline and stuff because you needed to go run and get the hell away from it, and then you could calm back down. But now we're in that stress, and nobody uses. You're just full of all this stress to get you to exercise, but you're stuck in an office, mm-hmm. so everything's going crazy. So your cortisol's going up which is going to affect how, how well you digest. And then then it's going to have the cravings for the shit food. And it's like just this train wreck of stuff where if you could learn to control that, 
and keep yourself in, in a parasympathetic state more often, it's going to help your training. It's going to help your nutrition. It's going to help your body fat, all of that stuff. And I think even the, the training, I mean, I think it all goes together. It's like a balance. So you can do everything right, but if you're if you're if you're still highly stressed all the time, your results aren't going to be as good as if you can control that as well. Yeah. Parasympathetic states are the states that you can achieve an erection too. So you have to be actually okay. So now you got me thinking here. <laughs> First of all, I laughed the other, I, 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 maybe it was with Dave where you're like, you're not going to get a boner when you're like in the middle of a heavy deadlift. And just the fact that you say boner makes me laugh. I don't know why, but um, there, there, there's a great clip where it was with Dave and Tom and Tom was like, what are the side effects of excessive masturbation? And I said, chafing and Dave just lost it. <laughs> Cause I didn't expect that out of him. And I was just like, <laughs> I mean, we, it, that's actually an accomplishment when you can make Dave laugh like where he can't stop it. That's actually an accomplishment. I, I felt that way. I was like, <laughs> oh, I said something right. That's cool. <laughs> but there, that is that analogy of uh, squatting or deadlifting I use very often because it resonates with the fitness community. Because if you're going for like a one rep, one rep max PR, and if you think about what it's like coming out of the hole and how you're about to shit your pants and turning purple and holding your breath and like literally under the most stress ever and mm -hmm. somebody walks by and is like, you know, hey, let's go. You're not popping a boner right there. Yeah. And that, that is the same impact that stress has on your body because it's like, yeah, we're not going to have Chad procreate right now because we need to keep him alive during this extremely stressful yes. time. And you have to be parasymp parasympathetic to achieve an erection. And then the sympathetic nervous system is where ejaculation takes place. So in the metal commu medical community, the term for that is point and shoot to be able to remember that. So point being parasympathetic, shoot, sympathetic. So that's an inter that's a really interesting analogy. I'm like, I'm just sitting here and I'm going to be thinking, I'm going to be percolating on that for a couple of days. Cause I, I like that analogy and it really works. It's kind of the same thing I was saying, only it's more intense. Like it gets to the, it gets to the point of it. Cause like, okay, well, it's the same thing. If like your body's not going to digest, right. Cause it's trying to save itself. Yeah. But if you're in that parasympathetic, then it's going to, to do all that and control that. And that's especially yeah. for a dude, like not getting a boners, like that hits a guy like, in a sensitive place, I guess you could say. <laughs> I, I relay, like I connect everything to the boner because then they listen. So, yeah. you know, hey, you have to do cardio because it's going to help your blood flow and all these mm -hmm. healthy things, which allows for better boners. Oh, yeah. you, you have to rest because it allows for better boners. It's the same if they have a deadline that they're trying to hit at work. They have a lot of emotional stress or it could be physical stress of training. Um literally any type of stress that's how it's going to uh impact your body yeah like, impact your boner <laughs> so you also said an interesting thing you, you I, like everybody who's listening you should follow her on instagram because there's so many great little clips that you post on there you posted one the other day about the like if guys really overweight and heavy and then he has a low test. It might not be the best thing to go directly on test, but to start exercising and to, to drop some of that body fat. Mm -hmm. I've never really heard anyone say that, but it really resonated with me. Like that makes a lot of sense to me. The uh, approach that we take in, in our coaching, I've termed GPP for TRT and in the fitness world, we know GPP stands for general physical preparation. Mm -hmm. And this is basically GPP to get ready to go on TRT. However, it can work for somebody who's already on TRT. doesn't matter. But it's kind of a double-edged sword because testosterone can be the catalyst to get somebody motivated and off the couch and ambitious. But if you have a lot of body fat, as I said before, that's a very inflammatory tissue. So the inflammation in your body being high, your body's suppressing a hormone. 
for a reason because it wants you to get rid of anything that is not priority being boners and all that stuff because it's just inflamed and if you add an exogenous hormone to an inflamed body the experience is not going to be as i would say efficient as it were if somebody was lower body fat and taking testosterone so they may experience not so pleasant side effects they may not feel as good because they have high body fat so if we can get a guy as resilient and healthy and as lean as as he can when he does go on testosterone it's going to be a better experience for him mm -hmm. Because there are men who are very overweight who have gone on TRT and been like, you know what? This is not for me. I don't like how I feel on it. And we don't want that to happen because it is a crucial hormone and it's a very safe medication. But guys just don't feel good just because they have all that inflammation that they're swimming in. And it's just not something that's going to benefit them in the long run because TRT is not the panacea of destroying everything bad in your body. It actually helps augment your recovery and helps you function as a man. However, we also have to take into account the lifestyle stuff that like that has to be dialed in whether you're on TRT or not. And that's right. why it can work for anybody who is on TRT or not. But, you know, the, the emphasis is on getting somebody prepared to be able to go on something that they have to commit to for the rest of their life. Do you feel like if someone has higher body fat, they would convert test to estrogen more? There is a little more aromatase activity. Uh, so that can happen. And that's where a lot of those like side effects occur with having mood swings and, and just not having a pleasant time on testosterone and feeling like they retain a lot of water and all that stuff. Whereas like, the conversion of testosterone to estrogen through exogenous testosterone, you need that to happen because men need testosterone, or sorry, men need estrogen mm -hmm. just like women need testosterone. So there is a level that is very healthy and men are quick to blame estrogen for feeling a certain way when it's really more the insulin resistance that is the problem. It's not estrogen. That's a problem. Interesting. I ha I switched a at one point I had switched my GP doctor's and she's like, okay, now we need to focus on getting you off that testosterone. And I go, excuse me? <laughs> what What did you say? She's like, yes, my studies, the studies show that being on testosterone has all these side effects. And I go, hold on one second. Because I'm, I'm not one. I don't just go, oh, you're a doctor. You're smart. Yeah. I go, you're a doctor. So what? You went to school. So most of my doctors, I get to the point where I pretty much go in and go, hey, here's what I want. And here's why. And they go, okay. Cause I bring in usually enough evidence that I prove them that this is what I want. So I, I go, you, the studies that you've been reading, I go, who are they on? I go, are they on a guy who sits around an adult man who sits around playing video games all weekend, drinking code red and eating Cheetos? Or are your studies on somebody who actually uses the testosterone through weightlifting and training and being active? And she kind of paused and she goes, Oh, that's a pretty good point. And I'm like, yeah. Yep. But I do, I like, cause like with when I'm, when I'm talking to people about depression, we'll usually talk about medication. And I really, I feel like you should do everything you can do to get better without the medication. I'm not a fan of medications, mm -hmm. but I do agree that there's a point where you can use it. And I, I I actually was talking to one of my clients the other day. There was a point, this is a while back now, but when I kind of stopped competing in my, and I had to get my mental health right, there was a point where I started feeling like the suicidal tendencies were getting pretty strong. And I had made promises to people I love that I would never go to that place again. So I went to my doctor and I go, here's what I want. Here's why I want this. And I only want it for four weeks. Don't write me a six month script. Don't write me a two month script. I want it for one month. Mm -hmm. I go, I'm struggling right now and I need something to help me get back on track. Cause I'm still trying and what I'm trying right now isn't working. So I need something to help. And I took it for that, for that <laughs> amount of time and continued to work on it. And then I went off and I was fine. 
So like, I'm not against the meds if you need them, or if, if you're really struggling and you need to go on the meds to help get you going, that's cool. But I, the idea for me is like, there's a lot of ways to control it without the meds. And I think we should try and see if you can do that first. Yeah. You know, and like, I imagine, I don't know if this is true or not. I have questions about why people's testosterone gets low. Um, I've known a lot of power lifters that put up huge numbers clean. And then all of a sudden they find out they're on, they have low test. And I'm like, well, are they, are they on low test? Cause they push their body beyond anything it's capable of keeping up with. Or is it something else? And so I wonder, like, how many of these guys that go in and go, oh, I got low tests, and they carry all that fat in their hips and their midsection, was it because they're not doing anything? Like, what, what's going to happen with their test levels if they get in shape and they start eating better and they start exercising? Will they come up to a normal level? I mean, shouldn't we at least try and see first? Yeah. That's always a good plan, and – you know, the sedentary lifestyle plays into it. A lot of the endocrine disrupting chemicals play into it. So it's hard to reconcile test levels of a teenager in a man through natural means and keep it there. Mm -hmm. So you, you can absolutely jump a few hundred points if you can dial in your nutrition and sleep and training and all of that. But it, it's hard to actually keep it there for a long time. Uh, there are outliers, but I do feel strongly that most men will or should end up on testosterone. Why? Well, I, I think, I think, except for my father, my father's 75 and they're keeping track of his test levels because he has prostate cancer. He's at like 900. Yeah. There, there's times where and like, I'm like, father I'm like, and oh. the son. Yeah, I'm like, so your son has low tests and you got nine yeah, at that, 75. That's that's I go, that is it's messed up, man. That's what it's that so, is. Yeah, it's so <laughs> weird. They're like, my dad's like 82 and his test is 800. I'm like, yeah, that's a thing. <laughs> it's not uncommon, so. But I do, yeah, I try, like all of my clients, once we start training, and I mean, everybody gets in their 30s or 40s. I'm like, hey, dude, if you have insurance, man, go get this tested. Or if you don't, Get it tested because insurance really forces you to qualify for TRT. Yes. The, the ranges now are so abysmal that pretty much you could be a, a guy who's like 29 with a test level of 250 and be told you're normal. Yeah, I don't I don't, I don't understand why that range is so big anyway. Like, and I have had different ranges depending on who's, who does the blood work, but usually anywhere from like 300 to 1,000. And I'm like, that's because I, I am on HRT and I play with it myself. And like, I feel a whole lot different at 400 or at 800. Like that's a big range. It is a big range. And it, it, it's it been decreased like twice in the last couple of decades. Like the, the high end used to be 1100. Now there's actually doctors that will say, oh, anything over a thousand is dangerous. We have to lower your dose. And I'm like, so you're telling this man that 1100 was good and was acceptable 10 years ago, but now it's too high. Most men are going to feel good over like seven, 800 total yeah. testosterone. That's where like, they're going to feel good. They're going to operate a lot better if their free T is like 30 plus, but there's that's some of the danger with a general practitioner or somebody through insurance is because they have to go by these ranges because the insurance companies set those like insurance companies want you to fall under 300 twice in a row in order to qualify for TRT. It's just a made up number. Whereas, I first, I, yeah. I was, I was fortunate. I was a high level power lifter by the time I found out I had low tests. So I actually had people to talk to about it. But the, the, when we found out I had low tests, it was my, my general found out. Mm -hmm. And cause I kept getting really, really sick. And eventually I got sick and dropped like 12 pounds in a day. And we ran all these tests and he's like, the only thing that's wrong with you is your test level. And I'm like, it was at like 115 or 112 or something. Wow. And I'm like, doctor, cause my doctor was actually a master's Highland game thrower. <laughs> I'm like, you know me, you know, I squat a thousand pounds and I bench seven and I pull seven. 
I go, how is this even possible? And he's like, honestly, I don't know, but I told him to check it twice and you're, you're low. And I felt so wonderful, wonderfully better when I went on, like so much better that within like a week and a half, my teammates are like, dude, what's up with you? What's going on? And I go, what? I feel great. Why are you guys on me, man? And they're like, yeah, why are you so happy? Like, why are you smiling so much? I go, I don't know. I guess it's a test. I feel better. But then I also found out that my general wasn't really paying attention to anything else. And I started feeling really shitty. And luckily I go through all of my blood work and stuff. And I'm like, dude, my estrogen went through the roof. And I was getting, man, I was crying at TV commercials, man. Like I was so emotional. And that's when I actually went to, I found a TRT doctor. And that was a whole different ball game where he started actually checking everything. So like, yeah, I tell people like your general is probably not the best person to, to, they don't seem to have a lot of knowledge about all of that and how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Allie, I'm going to, I'm going to go, we'll go ahead and wrap this up here. There was, it was a great conversation. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff. Yeah, that was fun. Um, to go through, but let, so, so what your, uh, isn't your Instagram just. The Allie, Allie Gilbert. Yep. ALI. Yeah. ALI, Allie Gilbert. They need to check that out. People should probably check out the Silverback Summit. Um, I think that one sounds really cool. Yes. Um, it's still funny to me. Not in a funny, bad way, in an ironic way. It's like, dude, these chicks helping out dudes. Probably better than a lot of dudes are helping dudes. <laughs> I just try my best, but I, I do love it. I do love what I do, and it's very rewarding. So, I think yeah. it's it's definitely something that needs to be done. And, I mean, probably if you wanted to do another podcast, we could do that too. <laughs> There's a lot of different avenues to go and just like – Men being men, and I don't think men are men anymore, and that's kind of sad to me. No, and I I want them to be, and I want them to feel like they can, and not feel like they have to, you know, be part of this eradicate masculinity movement. So yeah, my DMs are always open for them. So so if people want to find out about the Silverback Summit, is that because you have AllieGilbert.com too, right? Yeah, but we're we're in the middle of redoing our website, so the old okay. one probably is it makes no sense. But silverbacksummit.com is where they should go. Okay. To find out all the details on that and get your tickets. Cool. Well, thank you for being on. I really appreciate it. It was a good talk. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Courage Barbell Unlimited podcast. For more information, please visit couragebarbell.com. Until next time.